Well, as we come here this evening to hear these stories of welcome, I'd like to begin by telling you a story of welcome. Though it's not what you might expect. It happened in very cold November morning in 2018. And I went to northern France to meet some migrants, refugees, who were hoping to make their way across the channel. And I was with a group, Secure Catholique, who their custom was to take hot drinks to the places where they knew these refugees were assembling. So we made our way to a particular place. It was a clearing, clearing in a little woods, very cold morning. And these young men, most of them from Eritrea, South Sudan, in very light clothing, had built a little fire from twigs and branches that had fallen from the trees. And there they were huddled around, having slept out in the cold all night long. And we made our way to them. And as we approached, they got up and they motioned to us and they said, come, come and sit by the fire. We had slept in a warm bed all night. They had slept in the woods and they rose and they gave us their place beside the fire. It was an experience that teaches a lot. They had nothing, they had lost everything, but they had not lost their capacity for hospitality and compassion. In March of this year, I had the opportunity to visit Napier Barracks in Folkestone. I accompanied the Papal Nuncio. And we went around the barracks, I must say, we were very well received. And we listened to several accounts of treacherous journeys across the Mediterranean and across the English Channel in little dinghies. And the Nuncio asked one of the young men a very open-ended question, what would you like? And his answer was, I would like to see my mother. Through such encounters, and encounters is what we're speaking about this evening, minds are opened. And it is seen that refugees, migrants, asylum seekers are like ourselves. They have all the human qualities of understanding and emotions, but the common experience of many refugees is that they mean nothing to anyone of being dehumanized. Welcoming the stranger is integral to the Christian faith. It's not an add-on. Welcoming and supporting refugees is derived from what we believe, our faith. We believe we are made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore human beings have an infinite worth. Attitudes which undermine the value of anyone need to be challenged. And unfortunately, as we know, these attitudes towards migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers can be enshrined in policies. And anything that impinges upon the humanity of refugees has to be resisted. In the theological approach, the human issue must always be kept at the center because each human being has a dignity, regardless of their citizenship, visa status, or mode of arrival, human rights and human dignity must be respected. It always takes priority even before the national interest. Whether one is aware or not, Christ has in some way united himself to every person. He identifies himself as the one to be cared for in that well-known passage about the last judgment, Matthew 25. I was a stranger and you visited, fed, clothed me. Assistance given to migrants, refugees and asylum seekers is not almsgiving. 
It is not an act of kindness, though it might be, but really it's an act of justice. Solidarity with the most vulnerable comes from believing that we are all fellow members of one human family and our resources have to be shared. Now in this stories of welcome event, I assume that many of us have met refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. We have learned their story. But tragically, there are 85 million thereabouts such displaced people in the world. The conflicts and imbalances in the world leading to such displacement has caused some to describe the refugee crisis as a great wound, a global wound. Whenever a patient comes to a medical practitioner, we hope that they're not seen as a problem, but someone to be tended to and healed. And it is precisely the same with migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. Welcoming them is to participate in their healing, to participate in the healing process. Otherwise, they're just looked upon as a problem. In listening to migrants and refugees, we believe we are listening to God himself. On Pope Francis, we know, when addressing the issue of migrants and refugees, often in the same breath speaks the parable of the Good Samaritan. When someone is injured, they will remain injured unless someone is willing to go to their aid. And of course, it is very important to understand <clears throat> the reasons for migration. War, natural calamities, persecution, and discrimination of every kind deprive millions of their homes, employment, family, and homeland. And it is important also to acknowledge that we are not entirely blameless our contribution to the climate emergency results in droughts, disasters, and displacements thousands of miles away. Pope Francis says, the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth are the same thing. Humanity, we know, is interconnected, and so decisions and actions made in one part of the world affect those far away. And as for war, well, war is waged with weapons. Who supplied the weapons? The truth and reality of the situation needs to be presented, and that is our duty. And that means challenging the rhetoric of those opposed to migration and assisting refugees. In recent months, we know those concerned about the issue of migrants and refugees in this country have also been very concerned about the law, particularly the Nationality and Borders Bill now Act. The purpose of the law is to serve justice and mercy. When the law inflicts trauma, stress and suffering on asylum seekers through indefinite detention and now deportation, it isn't upholding justice and mercy. The suffering of those who are already victims is compounded. What are national borders for? What is their purpose? They are for the protection of people. But today we see them used for the exclusion of people seeking protection. Nations do have a right to regulate migration across their borders, but alongside that right is the duty to protect and help those fleeing poverty and persecution and provide what is needed to live a dignified life. To banish them for seeking protection is wrong. We always have to keep in mind that to seek asylum is not illegal. Anyone whose life is threatened has the right to protection. And it is this element of persecution threat or danger, or being forcibly displaced, that gives rise to a right to seek asylum, 
rather than to migrate through ordinary channels. It is the right of human persons to migrate so that they can realize their God-given rights. To conclude, another story. Archbishop Justin Welby relates how, when he was working as a Noel executive, he was going home from work one afternoon, one Friday afternoon, and he was going down in the lift with his boss. And his boss said to him, Justin, what are you doing this weekend? And Justin Welby replied, oh, I'm going on a church weekend. And after a short pause, the boss said, isn't it amazing the variety of hobbies that people in this company have? <laughs> and that response had a great impact on Justin Welby. Why are we here this evening? Why are we interested in the cause of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers? Well, I'm quite sure it's not, it's not a hobby. It's not just something we want to do. Some way to spend free time it is our obligation as Christians. And I find it remarkable and humbling how in the midst of suffering the faith of refugees in God and his goodness remains strong. I remember meeting a refugee from Mali who began or ended everything he said with the word inshallah, which probably you know means if God wishes. God has made a wish. And God's wish is that we assist our brothers and sisters in need and oppose all that denies them that assistance. And I thank you for all you're doing to make that happen.